Okay, we're ready to get started. I'm very excited to be here. I don't actually get a chance to come to the Netherlands that often. I've only been here for a few customer visits for Red Hat. Uh, but day, uh, last night, I was basically with the local Java user group community. That was really fantastic. We did all this cool stuff with Kubernetes and Istio Service Mesh and Knative, and we spent two hours together focusing on those kind of technologies. And today, we're going to do Quarkus. All right, we're going to talk about Quarkus and basically talk about how we make Java more awesome, specifically more enterprisey Java more awesome. And hopefully, we'll make that make some sense to you guys. Now, we're going to be going really fast in this session. I'll just warn you in advance. There's a bunch of stuff to cover, and we'll be moving right along. Hopefully, that'll be OK for you. I, when I'm in Germany, they tell me I speak way too fast. But I know the folks from the Netherlands, you know, the Dutch, they're like, no problem. You guys can talk fast, right? Fast English. So we're going to be moving along at a great clip. Just keep that in mind. But I want to show you a bunch of really cool things. And I'm assuming everyone here probably has a Java background. And therefore, I'm talking to the right audience. I've been spending a lot of time with Java myself over the last 20 plus years. It's really been a, a great career path for me, certainly. I've done a little Node.js along the way, and certainly a lot of C Sharp along the way. But Java is the place I've always come back to. I ran a Java user group for many years. I started a Java conference, developer conference, many years ago as well. And so I've really been part of the ecosystem for all this time. And I've actually been part of Red Hat now 13 plus years. I was part of that JBoss acquisition that happened back in 2006. And so I've been with the Red Hat community for a long, long time. And so that's who I'm representing today is certainly Red Hat. But I want to show you this technology, and we're going to really dive into this. Oh, and don't let me forget, I brought a bunch of cool stickers. We can come up and collect them at the end of the presentation. So we're going to talk about supersonic subatomic Java. And actually, I came up with that tagline because I was trying to come up with some clever way to introduce Quarkus to the world at large. So let's get into this. OK, this is my Mark Twain Duke. We've been talking about the death of Java forever. Things have been trying to kill Java forever. It was supposed to be Ruby, and it was supposed to be you know, Node.js. Now it's supposed to be Python and Kotlin. Everybody's trying to get rid of Java, which I think is kind of funny, because Java continues to do incredibly well. And if you remember Mark Twain, he's very famous for this quote. We actually started talking about the death of Java back in 2006. So it's been a long time we've been talking about Java. And it's kind of funny how we think of it from that perspective. But Java continues to do incredibly well. If you look at these indices right here, these rankings, Java's either in the first or second place alongside JavaScript. And that doesn't seem to be changing over the last several years. Java continues to be the hottest technology in the market for getting a nice salary right here in the Netherlands. This is what I was told yesterday at great length. There are more jobs for experienced Java developers than there are Java developers. Is that true? OK? And the good news is you guys are incredibly special. You take, you're taking a day out of your work life, and you're coming here to get additional education. And I really appreciate you giving me that time. So thank you for that. But I understand that you guys are already very special. You're able to get further educated. You're able to get more information, have greater context, greater perspective. And that makes you even more valuable. Not everybody actually will come out and join their local Java user group, or come out to their J Spring day, or J Fall day, or their Dev Nexus, or their Dev Ox, or whatever it might be. So you guys already are, are the exceptional group there, OK? So there's so much goodness going on in the Java ecosystem. It's primarily based on all the tooling and the frameworks that are available to it. And that's why we love Java, because if there's a problem to be solved, it's probably been solved 18 times in open source already. You know, how many dependency injection frameworks, model, you know, MVC frameworks do you want? How many ORM solutions? How many different ways to do messaging? And how many ways to do you know, uh, whatever it might be, security frameworks, et cetera? They're all out there. The challenge is, when you start piling all these frameworks on top of the JVM or on top of Java, it gets a little bit big. It gets bigger and bigger. So in other words, there's so much to consume. When we start building our application stacks, we actually put a lot of weight on Java. And the problem is, when you put Java in a container, and I've done this presentation now for a couple years, this concept here, when you put Java in a Linux container, you know, Docker Linux container, and you do that Docker build and Docker run, you often will see it blow up. And maybe you have had this in production for a while, and you see it just shuts down, and you don't know why. And that's because if you constrain that container's memory resources, Java by default, Java 8, early versions of Java 8, is actually fixed in the latest image of Java 8 on Docker Hub right now. But then it will basically say, oh, I see the whole host. I see all the memory on that computer. I see all the CPUs on that computer, not just the ones I'm constrained to with C groups inside the Linux container. And I try to allocate all of them. Because by default, Java was built to use all the RAM on the server back in the day. Okay? Therefore, it blows up because C groups, the Linux kernel, says, sorry, you're outside your boundaries. Stop right now. And it kills you. It's called OOM killed, out of memory killed. 
So you see that happening in a Docker world. You see that happening in a Kubernetes world. And the good news is in a Kubernetes world, it just restarts it automatically. And I've had managers, senior managers, tell me this is wonderful. The fact that Kubernetes restarts these things automatically is brilliant because my programmers are always running the thing out of memory. Or better yet, my programmers are, also, are always eating all the threads in the thread pool or all the connections in the connection pool, and it locks up. Because that's actually the bigger problem, right? The JVM basically locks up. It won't handle any more requests once you've basically filled all the uh, buffers. And of course, all the threads in the thread pool have been lo uh, locked up because you didn't use a finally you know, block correctly. Try catch finally. So we've had that problem in production for many, many years. And the operations team would go restart it. You guys remember those? You probably have some of that now. I saw earlier in the session earlier, everybody's still on Java 8, so you probably still see this problem now. So this is the kind of problems we've been thinking about at Red Hat. How do we actually make Java more proficient, more performant, and simply better, more Kubernetes native, more container native, more cloud native? All right? Because when you lock it down, it goes boom. So that's the way to think about it. And so again, if you've had things just shutting down and you don't know why, I'm telling you, it's C groups. That's primarily what it is. Look for the out of memory kill. OK? So let's actually show you a demonstration, though, of what it means to get started with Quarkus. OK, we're going to talk more about this container thing a little bit later. But I want to talk about more of what it means to get started with Quarkus. So let's do that. Let's switch gears over here. OK, looks like my internet performance is working, so we can make this work. So let me do this. I'm going to come over here and say clear. Let's actually build a new directory. Uh, and this is Quarkus, by the way. This is the website, quarkus.io. You can see it right there. I'm going to just come over here and basically grab one statement. There's a Maven plugin that helps you get started. And so I'm going to build a directory. Uh, let's see, we're here at JSpring. I'm going to CD into JSpring. Obviously, there's nothing in there right now. I'm going to run this one command, hit Create, and it's going to basically prompt me for the things I need, like I need a package, so com.br sutter JSpring. And then I want the JSpring project, and then the 10 snapshot's fine. Go ahead and give me a default REST uh, endpoint. Yep, that, fantastic. All right, and you can see right here, we actually have a little bit of a project already built out for me. OK, so we have a Maven project with POM XML. Gradle supported as well, by the way. I, I have my two Docker files. And you'll notice there's one for the JVM mode and one for the native mode. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But basically, you can build your container either pure JVM or you can build your container native executable. OK? There's the Hello World resource here that is my JAXRS endpoint and a single application.properties where all the configuration goes. Notice there's an index.html and there's some test. I can bring this up in my programming editor, and I use Visual Studio Code here. So I'm going to pull that open. And the reason I use Visual Studio Code, and I'll just show you this, I, uh, one I've always been a big fan of um, lightweight editors in general. Right? That's just kind of the world I come from, mostly because I'm so old. But you know, the whole heavyweight IDE thing was never attractive to me. But this is something we did at Red Hat to actually contribute this to the upstream Visual Studio Code. And there's 17 million downloads of the language support there. So that's, so it's also a cool tool from that perspective. And let me come in here now and open, open up this piece of code. We're going to open up this Java file. So here it is. You can kind of see right there that it basically says hello. On the path, hello, return, hello. Again, standard JAXRS, nothing unusual there. Let me bring up a terminal, though, and say maven quarkus dev. So the first thing I'm going to do is throw it into, and actually make sure I say compile. So you know, let's make sure we compile the code. And dun, 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 dun. But basically, I'm throwing it into development mode. And what this means is it's meant to be interactive. It sets up the debug port, and everything is ready to go from a developer perspective. So if you're familiar with Node.js, we're kind of entering that mindset now. Okay, So just keep that in mind. Watch this. So I'm going to come over here to my, uh, my browser. And let's just go localhost 8080. There's the index HTML being served. And here's hello. And so you can see it right there. Okay. And no big deal. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And let's come over here and say, well, let's make it bonjour. All right. Save, refresh. So edit, save, refresh. Edit, save, refresh. This is a new way of working. Now, you might have had something like JRebel before, and it kind of sort of did something similar, but it cost 100, 200 euros to, you know, to add to your IDE. This is something you can get with VI or Emacs or whatever. Okay? It's just out of the box. We basically dynamically reload that application. And so if I want to say, I think you guys are hello, right, here in uh, the Netherlands. So I can just keep doing that. I can just keep editing, saving, things like that. And I will show you something more sophisticated than that in a second. That's kind of easy stuff. But let's also check out the fact that we have inline test, 
course, you know, you want to have tests for your application. And so here's my test. The same concept is if I want to interactively test my application, it's easy to just say run test, see what those tests do. Oh, I have an X here. I open that up. And that's because it used to say hello, and now it says hello. So let me fix that. Uh, I can come over here and you know, put that in. All right, and then I can say save, run test. And so now my test should be green because I've hopefully fixed it. Fantastic. But that kind of model is just the back and forth development model that you have now in this new world. And again, if you want to use Emacs, you could. OK, it doesn't require any kind of fancy IDE extensions. It's actually part of that Maven plugin that we have right here for the interactive development. So now let's go do something for real, OK? That is, that is super simple, but let's do something real. Because most people that I run into build applications that actually talk to a database, and they get data out of the database and put it on a web browser or an API, and they get data from the browser, mobile browser, API, mobile app, back into a database. Isn't that what we mostly do in our lives, right? At least I do. So what I want to do now is this Maven, Quarkus, list extensions. Because one of the things that we've done is we've optimized a, a bunch of the frameworks in the ecosystem to be ready for this hardcore cloud-native world that we're living in now. So you can see there's a bunch of them out here. And I'm going to go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and pick some. But let me go ahead and grab this. I'm going to basically say I want to add an ex a few extensions here. So Ma Maven Quarkus add extension. List the extensions. And I'm going to come here and say, oh, there you go. I want to talk to PostgreSQL. All right, we got that one. All right, we want to talk to PostgreSQL. What else do I want? I want JSONB, and you'll see why in a second. You know, JSONB will basically automatically produce JSON for me. Oh, and I'm going to get this one called Hibernate ORM Panache. You guys have certainly heard of Hibernate at this point. You might not realize that Hibernate, the team, works at Red Hat. The core contributors to Hibernate work at Red Hat. So one of the things we've done is we've looked at a lot of the ecosystem libraries, and we've started to optimize them in clever ways. So if you look down here, you know, you'll see just a, a couple options there, you know, like Netty, and, and we've optimized for Kubernetes, and there's things like Vertex, REST, EZ, Camel, you know, Apache Kafka. And, and this is just a subset, right, just the icons. We continue to do that and add more every couple of weeks. So now if I run this extension add tool, it basically edits my existing application the POM XML, and I'll say, yeah, go ahead and reload that. OK, and then we can go look at our POM XML here. You'll see that it just added a couple things for me, right? There's the PostgreSQL or in Panache, OK, and then the JSONB, fantastic. So let me go back into my Quarkus dev mode again. And now I'm going to be ready to do something kind of cool now. OK, so now I have the infrastructure application logic in place. So I don't really want to build Hibernate. I want to use Hibernate. I don't want to create you know, the JSONB binding. I want to just use the JSONB binding. That's kind of the idea and the principle that we have here. So the first thing I want to do is declare an entity. Okay? And you notice I said Panache there. Panache is actually a new library that basically makes Hibernate easy. If you've heard of Active Record, like in Ruby on Rails, things like that, it basically makes Hibernate easy. So I'm going to say to do.java. And this is my new class. And I can say now, OK, at entity. All right, we're going to declare an entity. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. There's the at entity. And now I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to extend panache entity. Let's see there. There we go. And now I'm going to do a couple other things that are a little bit interesting. I'm going to say public string title, because my to do, we're going to do a little to do application, has a title for the to do, like wash the dog, pick up milk kind of thing. I'm going to say public, uh, let's say Boolean completed. Yeah, all right. And then public uh, int. Order. There's an order to these things. And, and order is one of those tricky ones that sometimes causes Postgres some difficulty. So I'm going to say name equal ordering. So it has a different column name in the database. And oh, it looks like I get my import right here. Let's see. And there we go. All right. Now we have our entity. OK. And so that's, that's all it is. That's all I have to do. I don't have to have getters and setters and all that in this panache world. So in panache world, we basically say, let's make some assumptions. You model out what the schema should look like. And that's it. That's all you have to do. You can add getters and setters and override the behavior. You can add additional finders and override the behavior. But that's all I have to do for now. And we'll, come, we'll see why, that, why that's interesting in a moment. Uh, but now I need to connect to my database. So the first thing I need to do is go build a database. So we call this thing the JSpring. So we need to add a, a user here. Let's call this thing JSpring. And yep. And we're going to give it the, we're going to give it a password. And we're going to give it some privileges. So we're going to add the user for JSpring. And then we're going to come over here and add a database for JSpring, map to the JSpring user. 
and that should be all good if I did everything correctly. So I have a database now, and you'll see if we look at schemas, right here, tables, you can see there's no tables. The tables are currently empty, okay? Now, we need to have a little bit more fun with this. I need to now add a REST endpoint that talks to it. And so I can do that via a simple mechanism. I can come over here and say, let's add a new class to do resource. OK, let's see if we did that right. Let's add a new class here. And we want to call this a JAXRS endpoint, so path. We want the path to be the root. And we want the uh, produces. Yep, we want it to produce uh, the media type. Oh, helps we spell media type correctly. Yeah, the uh, application JSON. And we'll consume that also. Uh, consume. Dun, 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 that looks good. And let's actually just do this for now, just to make this a bit easier. Do, 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 do. OK, so we got consumes, and we have produces. And let's do this. OK, again, if you're familiar with JAXRS, it's pretty straightforward. Public, and now I need to I want to return my to dos, so I'll say a list of to dos. Whoop. And dun, dun, dun. and so get all of them. How about that? Just give it a method name, and then I can say return to do list all. There we go. Looks pretty good. Oh, need to get my list imported here. Let's see, Java util list. Okay. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So you notice I basically put it here on root. So again, standard JAXRS. Are you guys familiar with JAXRS? Nothing weird looking here, nothing unusual. So all good there. So if I come over here to my local host, and you notice there's my hello again. Uh, oh, look, I have an error. What happened here? Build failure, build due to, uh, let's see what here, configuration error, hibernate extension, cannot guess the dialect, and there is no JDBC driver specified at Quarkus data source driver. So this is already another thing that's kind of unique. We will throw the errors into the browser. Now, again, if you're a Java person, you're like, well, I don't know about that. But in this interactive development mode, this is how it works for a Node.js developer. Okay, this is how their brain works. They're like, you just edit, save, refresh. And if you have an error, you get the error. If you have the real result, you get the real result. So I don't have a, J I don't have a data source declared. Uh, and I forgot to add that. So let's go add that real quick. You basically have to come down here to the resources and add application properties. Now, I already have the application properties listed over here. Um, so I don't have to remember all these by default. And actually, we're going to change this to actually uh, put these in, by, uh, in for free. But I called that thing JSpring. I called the user JSpring. And I have the password also as JSpring. All right. OK, so if I did that correctly, save. I just saved the property file, hit refresh. Oh, we're good now. OK, so edit, save, refresh. And if I come look at the, uh, my, my schemas, let's see what that looks like. Refresh over here, tables, to do, columns. Look at that. I have my schema now generated for me automatically. And that's just a Hibernate feature. You know, we've been using Hibernate forever. Hibernate's, what, 15 years old at this point. So this concept of schema mapping and schema generation has been out there a long time. The difference now is it's optimized for this interactive development world, and more importantly, optimized for compiling to a native world in a native binary form, which you'll see in a little while. OK, so we'll talk more about that. But here I have my schema now, and I can basically start laying out my application. So if I come over here, I can say, let's go into this to-do resource. Oh, we, did, we started that already. I want to take you to the root. So not hello here. But let's go root. And then there's this weird web page. And it just basically tell, kind of you know, gives you some instructions. That web page is actually available over here. Uh, let's uh, dun, 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 dun. I was, I'll just show it to you from the finder perspective. So it's under source, main, resources. There it is. That's where it is. Well, let's just delete it. OK, move, remove that one. So it's just a standard Maven project, nothing unusual. So that's all we're dealing with right now, standard Maven project. And if I come over here now and hit refresh, we get an empty array. Because we don't have any to-dos in our list, right? So if you look at it from this perspective, there is nothing coming back from the database at this point in time. You also notice that our schema is being generated right here. Or sorry, our, our SQL is being generated. Uh, and that is due to this property. We can see it says log SQL true, which is cool. You can see what's going on there at the Hibernate level. And then now I can say things like curl localhost 8080. Right? I can just interact with it. And the curl or the refresh, all that works. Right? You basically are simply reloading that application. Uh, now, let's do something for real with it, or a little bit more interesting at least. Let's 
let's add a user interface. And this is actually a user interface that comes from Todo MVC. It's actually an open source project. They already have all the UI done. I'm not a front end developer. I'd like to be more full stack, but I'm just not really a front end developer. You know, I'd, I'd like, I have to, just a skill I have to learn more. So I'm going to take advantage of the fact that some wizards out there actually built us something really interesting and made it available. I'm going to paste it in, hit paste, now the right, come back to my browser, hit refresh. That's all good, but this is actually under to do HTML, and there's my UI. OK, so I have a user interface now that's all really it's built in Vue.js. You can actually see it says Vue.js there. And it is part of the project called to do MVC, right? Uh, there's their uh, to do MVC. Let's see here, these guys. All right, and you can, get, you can get different versions of this, Backbone, Dojo, Angular, right? So we have the Vue one here, Knockout. Um, and that's neat, because they've already built the UI for me. But now let's finish building out some of this back end. All right, we have the building now to query. So let's actually add one. So we're going to basically post. I'm going to go ahead and make it transactional because I know that they're, you know, I want to really persist in a database in a transactional way. And I want to say public, yeah, public. And then we're going to do a response. Yeah, we're going to have a response, and we're going to add one. And to do item is going to come in in JSON form. That's a JSON be in action. And then I need to basically say item.persist. I can basically now write that to the database. And I can say return, response, OK. And we're going to return the item, and then status. And then we're going to basically say, actually, status. I, always, I sometimes get these backwards. OK? And then 201.build. Let's see. Oh, and I'm having challenges here because this thing's not imported. Let's import it. There we go. And I think I did things in the right order. Or did I get them backwards again? Sometimes I do. Yes, I did. OK. Status. So OK, basically, I want to return the entity, because in, in the case of a nice RESTful architecture, right, you want to basically return the entity that was just added. So OK, I think I did that right now. And there's the, you can see my select statement. OK, let's do this. One. OK, two, three. And look back over here my log. Oh, I see my insert statements. Those look good. Let's go back to our database. And let's hit refresh here. And then to do, view the data. And we have one, two, three. OK, so now we're kind of cooking along. We have some, we're, we're really kind of building a little app here. We basically now have the ability to read and uh, add, create. So the C and the R have been covered of our CRUD app-based application architecture. Let's kind of continue on. So let's add a delete. Well, not a delegate. We want to delete. There we go. We want to delete. And then we also want to make that transactional. And in this case, we need to know which specific one you wish to delete. So let's do this. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Yep, there we go. And so public response again, delete one. And in the delete one case, we're going to have a at path param. And we're going to have the ID. Do, 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 do. And this is a long value ID. All right, looks good so far. OK, and then we're going to basically say to do entity equal to to do find by ID, like that one. There we go. Yeah, that's good. And then I'm going to say return the, uh, the response again. OK. The entity in qu uh, question. Actually, no. In the case of a delete, we don't, return, uh, we don't return that. We just return the status of 204. Uh, we deleted it. OK, so it's now deleted. So I think I did that right. Let's find out. OK, if I, and then here's the kind of the cool thing about this, though. I'm just kind of interacting back and forth with this thing. Notice if I hit refresh, all the data goes away. And that's because we're set up in this mode here of drop and create. OK, now I can change that to update. But right now, and actually, maybe we should do that. All right, let's change it to update. So now that it won't actually lose all the data I previously added instead of drop and create. So one, two, three. OK, and let's delete two here in the middle. Let's go check out our table again, refresh. Let's go see. I, and I like doing this. I like basically going to my database. Uh-oh, my, my two is still there. I failed. I did something wrong. Let's see what I did wrong. Uh, let's see. Did I mess this up somewhere along the way? Da -da -da, find by ID. Oh, the, it helps if you say delete. Yeah? OK. Let's try that. Uh, let's go back over here. And then not that one. Then let's refresh. OK. Let's delete two now. Did someone see that I missed the delete thing there and you didn't yell it out at me? And, okay, yeah, two's gone now. 
okay? So that concept, you know, again, interactive. Let's, just, let's do one more little thing, and then we'll kind of go show you some other things that are kind of fun. Uh, now that we have a delete, let's also add a patch. Because uh, this user interface sends in a patch, and actually, it's similar to what you see here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab uh, this concept here, paste that in. And so we're going to update one. And then uh, I'm going to provide a new to-do item. And then we have the long ID again. All right, that looks good. Find it. OK. And now we, let me see, let me close up this method correctly. And now we do a return response. Ah, response. OK. And OK, we're going to return the entity. And we're going to have a status of 200. And we're going to build that response, send it back. OK, but in that helps if you spell entity correctly. And then we're going to come over here now and do this thing. All right, so now we have the entity that we found from the database. And we're going to say, OK, completed is equal to the item that was inputted. So coming in, we're going to have the, uh, the order. Fantastic, equal to item.order. OK, entity.title. Yep, equal to item.title. So all we're doing is just simply mapping it. And then entity.id equal to the ID that was submitted. Let's see. All right, looks good. So if I did dial that correctly, we'll find out now. Let's go back over here. OK, and let's see. We have, let's add a, a hello and then world. And then I can kind of say, no, let's make that hello and bonjour. Hit return. OK, and first, the first one. And if I did that correctly, let's go check out our database. This is how I know that I did things OK. And actually, in this user interface for PG Admin, you've got to do a refresh. Hit all rows. And there's one, two, three. Hit all, all right, looks good. All right, so we now have create, read, update, delete. And you could go continue on with this. You could add a validation. And actually, let's add some validations real quick. Right? Just kind of make you, right now, if you have this situation where you can add three more than once, see, three. I don't want three more than once. I don't want world more than once. That doesn't fit my business use case. So let's fix that. And one of the things I'm going to do is come back over here now and put that drop and create back in, because I want to wipe out what was there. And I need to add a little bit of validation logic. So let's add a little bit of validation logic. So we want this to be not blank. And we want the column to also have a unique equal true. Yeah, yeah, there we go. OK, I think if I did that correctly, let's go hit refresh again. You see this process? Edit, save, refresh. So one, two, three. Let's try to add three again. Won't let me. Uh, two again. Won't let me. One again. Won't let me. One and more. Fine. And I didn't spell more correctly. Let's fix that. OK, and hit return. And then again, if I go look at my, you know, double check here on my Postgres, let's see what it says. Yeah, one, two, one and more. One, two, three, more. All right, fantastic. So I have a pretty, working, a, a pretty cool working application. Now, let's kind of show you what it means to kind of deploy this thing. This was JSpring. I can say Maven package. And that's all you really do with Maven package, right? You basically say Maven package. And it's going to go through the process of building that application. You can see it's even running my test there. Uh, it's actually setting up the table. OK, all good. And now we can basically look at the target directory. And let's go switch in a target, uh, LH here. And notice there's this jar file right here. So it's only 1.1 meg. And that might be throwing you off a little bit. You're, you're used to previous fat jar architectures that you saw maybe with Drop Wizard or Spring Boot or Vertex, or you know, everybody does a fat jar at this point in time. This is actually not a fat jar. And that's because a fat jar doesn't perform as well in a Linux container environment. In a Linux container environment, you actually want to separate application infrastructure from business logic. So this is just the business logic, and the application infrastructure is here in the lib folder. And so you, need to you have to combine both when you actually pull it in, uh, into a Docker image. And you can see that in the Docker file here. You'll see that there is the concept of adding lib in addition to the runner. Okay? So in addition to the app jar, you're going to also see the runner here. You're going to also add lib. So just bear that in mind. And therefore, if you actually are building images rapidly or often, you're only building just that topmost layer. OK, so actually, let's cut, let's close that down here. Come over here, and let's do this, java-jar, and then the jspring runner.jar. OK, and then there, there's our application, created the thing. So that's in JVM mode, started in 1.3 seconds, and we have our full application running again. And it should have dropped our database. Hello, uh, stuff happens, awesome. And then if I come over here and look at my database again, refresh, 
check it out. And all of you there. Okay, so there it is. So that's our, that could be our production app ready to go. But I actually want to do something else. Okay, I want to do a Maven package dash p native. And here, this is actually going to take a few minutes. And what this is going to do, it's actually going to basically uh, da, 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 native. Oh, it helps if you're in the right directory. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, you got to be in the right directory to run that one. So basically, it's it's part of the Maven plugin that I mentioned earlier, and it's going to go through the process of actually building that application to a native executable. In this case, for the Mac, there's also an option for Linux as well, uh, but I'm going to let it run for the Mac. And I want to show you this application now running uh, on the on the internet. So get pods. I have this I have this application already built and deployed up in Kubernetes, and it's a simple deployment process. But I can come over here now and say, uh, let's go do a poll. I have another endpoint on this one. So you can kind of see there it's polling the to-do application up on the public internet. And I can also do it this way. I have the ability to poll another endpoint on it. And this one right here, I have this thing called pod host. And all it's doing is returning the host name. In other words, the computer name that that Java application thinks it's running on. So if you think about it, it's just system env get uh, you know, system.getenv. What computer are you running on Java? And it says this one right here. And it thinks it's running. Oh, actually, let's do this in this window, get pods. We'll show you that right here. OK, it's running on this one. See, the names match. The pod identifier is the computer from a Java standpoint. And so now I can do some interesting things. I can scale it up. I can basically say I want more than one of those pods. So something as simple as, and you can just see what my little script looks like here. It's a simple cube control scale replicas two. I want two of those. And there's number two coming online, going to running. There it is. And so if I say, let's keep polling, I can kind of see that there'll be two different hosts in there. All right? I have two different computers on a dynamically load balancing back and forth. This is standard Kubernetes behavior. There's nothing unusual with this right now. Basically, you keep adding pods as long as it has a label that matches the label selector on the service, the Kubernetes service. It's part of the load balancer for free. It's part of the service discovery for free. And so that's just standard Kubernetes behavior. So I'm not showing you anything that's un unusual, but let me do this. Let me deploy a new version of this. OK. We're deploying a new version. Let's see what's happening here. Oh, let me run my polar. OK. You can see it's basically taking the old one down as it brings the new one up. And see that container creating right there? OK. And actually, sometimes my curl hangs. Come on, curl. There we go. So now it's on version 3. So basically, you can see we just did a rolling upgrade of all that infrastructure in just a few moments. The reason I show you this, this is why small and fast matters in this Kubernetes native world. You're going to be constantly in your CI CD world that you're going to be living in soon, where you're deploying not every three months, but maybe every month, or you're deploying every week, or you're deploying every day. As you start moving faster and faster through those deployment intervals, right, like I said with CI CD, you're going to have the situation where you need to deploy rapidly. And so just a simple rolling update quickly is a win. You're not down for long. You're, user, you're not down at all, right? You're not down at all. Basically, Kubernetes handles that rolling update. So I want to kind of show you that to kind of give you a feel for why we think of this in the Kubernetes context. Small and fast really matters. And it looks like my, um, my build happened over here. There is the native executable. Let's kind of look at it from that perspective. You can see it's 55 megs. That is the whole application compiled into a native executable. And so I can do this. I can just run it directly, uh, JSpring, and hit return. OK, the whole app, including the creating of the schema, the setting up of the connection pool, loading of Hibernate, started in 0, 0 0.3 sec three, four seconds. So this is just a different way of thinking about Java. And the reason this matters is because I've had plenty of conversations with people like, no, we have to move to Node.js now. We have to move to Go now. And I mean real customers who are like, we got to, I, I actually met with someone recently, and I showed them this. And he goes, you don't understand. I was literally about to start retraining 300 Java developers next week on Go because Java was too fat and slow. And they want to live in this new world, practicing CID and deploying all the time and basically starting up things quickly. So this is a kind of a game-changing you know, experiment. Oh, and well, let's, just, let's not mess around here. Let's prove Okay, this thing actually runs. Uh, let's come over here. And it basically should have dropped and create. Uh, let's uh, learn. Uh, does that mean something here? Uh, maybe I should fix that then. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, learn Quarkus. Okay, be awesome. All right, and then if I come back over here to my, let's go check out my database again. So you notice I love, this is a thing for me. I've been working with relational databases forever, and so I like to go to the database to see if that, you know, okay, good. There it is. My application is working. Okay, and you can kind of see what it means to kind of roll it around on a uh, uh, rolling update. So we're going to come back to this. We're going to show you a couple more things. Okay, dun, dun, dun. let's go back into slideware mode. Hopefully, I didn't take you guys too far afield, but you know, we'll go into slideware mode. We have a few minutes left, but I, there's another thing I want to really show you. Okay, so when you have to run Java at scale and all these little containers, starting fast, being small really, really matters. And it really matters because I want to take you back to 1999 for a second. 1999, I know some of you weren't born yet, or some of you weren't in the career path yet, and this is 20 years ago, but I was doing consulting in 1999. And did, do you guys remember in 1999, the US won the World Cup? You guys are big football fans, right? I coached soccer for 14 years. I, that is by far one of my favorite sports. I love actually being in Europe because you guys get you know, soccer, football culture. And you guys don't remember the US winning the World Cup in 1999? Wow, wow, because we did. Now think, think about what just happened in this room right now. You're well-paid, high-paid professionals, yet you have a mental bias that suggests Ladies can't win a World Cup, and they can. And I coached girls for 14 years, and I can tell you, I would, I would take my girls team and, and any 11 of you here, and they would destroy you, okay? They could rock. So we are, this is a very proud moment as an American who was a soccer fan, a football fan. But at the same time, I just use this as a funny way, especially here in the Netherlands and in Belgium. It works every time. People are like, no way the U.S. wins the World Cup. You forget. More than males can play at the World Cup level. Okay, now, the reason why I want to talk about 1999 is because if you've been in this world for some time and you actually built a Java application for deploying on the public internet, it cost you about half a million dollars to get started. Half a million dollars to get started. You guys remember those days? Some of you are too young, you're like, what do you mean half a million dollars? But it did. We bought an app server machine, we bought WebLogic, we bought a database machine, we bought Oracle. Oracle's the most expensive part of that. But this is exactly the stack that I, as a consultant, would go into a company and then charge my rates, you know, and lay into that, you know, architecture. And here's the best part. See the IDE? $50,000 for an IDE. Can you imagine that? But we did. We paid for the IDE back then. We paid for all of this, and it was very expensive. The problem is we live in a different world now. So Java was built for that era. Right? We built, that's Java used all that hardware, that's what was available to it. We didn't think about the hardware because Java just consumed it all. That was amazing. It took advantage of it. But now we live in this world where we, an application server starting it up takes like two cents or 20 cents or 50 cents per hour. A very different way of thinking about our application architecture. And so in this world, memory consumption, CPU consumption really, really matter. The smaller you are, the faster you are, the cheaper you are. It's a very different model. So I wanted you guys to remember that. Because if you think about it, Java was born in 1996. You can kind of see the, how the ecosystem has evolved since that point in time. Java has to evolve as well. I mean, there was not even Linux back in 1996, at least Linux at the enterprise level. Red Hat brought you know, Linux to the enterprise back in the early 2000s. We certainly didn't have virtual machines of any significance back then. We did virtualized Windows, but we didn't really do virtualized servers, really, in a significant way. There were Solaris and some other things, you know, AIX, et cetera. But even virtual really wasn't a significant thing back then. We also didn't have Linux containers, certainly, back then. So the world has evolved dramatically in forms of application architecture. We now have you know, the cloud. We now have the, what Netflix taught us with the um, ribbon and Hystrix and all those kinds of things. We also have the Docker Linux container, what happened there. We have Kubernetes. So the world has changed dramatically leading into 2015. And it's, it's, it's that time. And the reason I bring you to 2015 is because we actually started with Kubernetes. Red Hat is the second largest contributor to Kubernetes outside of Google itself. And we actually launched 1,000 containers live on stage for an audience, a much larger audience than this one. And we wanted to show what Linux containers could do. We launched 1,026 containers in two and a half minutes on stage. You can actually go watch the YouTube video, which I've added the link to. And by the way, the slide deck is that bottom most link there, the bit.ly Quarkus Java. I also sent it out on Twitter. But you can actually go watch that video and see what we did there. And people's minds were blown. You launched a 1,000 servers in front of us right now, and we did. Now, here was the challenge for me. I could only do that with Node.js. What was cool is we let everyone in the audience pick a server and then actually load something into it. 
from their phone. It was really awesome. But it had to be done with Node.js. You cannot do that with Java in two and a half minutes. So our, we've been thinking about this problem for quite some time. Why is Java the big, fat, and slow, and Node.js is the small thing? Okay? So this has been, we've been talking about this also. If you look at serverless, if you look at Amazon Lambda, if you Google, hey, I want to run Spring Boot or Java on Amazon Lambda, you'll find comments like on this Reddit thread. And the comments basically say, forget Spring Boot, you can't run Java on Amazon Lambda. Java's just too fat and slow. It makes no sense in a serverless-style architecture where you have to worry about the cold start latency. You have to worry about things booting up and actually having to be respond to that first request. That really matters in this world. So this is why we built Quarkus, right, to deal with this issue where we had customers and we had people saying, we're moving to Node.js, we're moving to Go. As a matter of fact, the day we launched Quarkus, if you look, there's another Reddit thread where I'm arguing with a guy, basically, who says, why in the world would Red Hat make any investment in Java? Java's dead, gone, done. Why would you bother making any investment to make it better? They, they just couldn't even comprehend why we did what we did. But hopefully you guys now understand why we did it. And you guys are certainly Java people and appreciate, hopefully, that we did it. So this Quarkus thing is a new project. Quarkus.io showed you the website. And we focused on making it 10x smaller, 100 times faster. And while you, when you do that, it kind of puts it in the same game as Node.js now. As a matter of fact, we have another benchmark. It's in the same game, game as Go. We're as fast as Go for certain use cases. So you don't have to retrain a node and Go. There's also all the developer experience stuff that we wanted to focus on. You saw the live reload, edit, save, refresh. There's also a reactive programming model that you can leverage. There's also for serverless style architecture that I'll show you in a second. But we have the concept of a Uber jar, fat jar, as well as a native executable. So you can go with the JVM or go without the JVM. And it's faster still in JVM mode. And we're really focused on this microservices containerized use case. Okay, focusing on that Kubernetes infrastructure, making Java more awesome. This is just a slight history of what you see in Linux containers. So this is the world of Linux containers and that's uh, unfolded. And again, if you put Java in a container, it starts to blow up if you don't treat it correctly. This is the serverless history as well. You can kind of see that we've been thinking about serverless use cases for quite some time as well as the industry. And then here's just some simple charts on, you know, well, how, what are the numbers, right? You can basically see instead of uh, 140 megs of RAM for uh, a REST endpoint, it's 15 or 13 megs of RAM for a REST endpoint, right? If it's a full REST plus CRUD, like the thing you saw me build earlier, instead of 218 megs of RAM, it's 35 megs of RAM. And that actual application I'm running right now is smaller than 35 megs of RAM. Okay, it's maybe just a little bit smaller. So let's actually kind of show you that. Let's see, I'm running that little application Okay, is my polar still working there? Just to show that it's still alive, and here and this is the application now. It's running on the public internet here. Okay, so you know, oh, so be awesome. Let's put our be awesome back. You guys can hit that URL yourself and start editing my, <laughs> my editing my database if you want, because it is out there on the public. But let me go here to Prometheus, and let's do this. This is to do, and this is my to do container. OK, hit go there. OK, looks like we're running, uh, you said this is the application. So it's under 20 megs of RAM right now. OK, so you know, it's small. A whole application running in a tiny memory footprint, a Java-based application uh, based on you know, the compiled and native like you saw me do earlier. So that's the do application. But you know, again, you saw me scale it up. You saw me rolling update it. That's cool. But well, let's do something a little bit more interesting than that. Let's come over here now. And let's let that go. And I want to do this. Let's do uh, Kubeness. Kubeness. And then we're going to go to the side by side. Let's see. Let's see if I'm in the right place. So, yeah. Kubectl get pods. You know, we could spend a lot of time talking about <laughs> all these things we're doing in Kubernetes land. But I want to show you this. I'm going to go to, I'm going to basically start up my Quarkus based application. Notice there's no pods running. There's no pods, no computers running, no containers running at this point in time. But when I actually send load in, I'm actually running Siege, which basically is sending 40 concurrent users. And because of that, the ratios I've set, it basically says, oh my God, 40 concurrent transactions coming at me simultaneously. This is Knative going, hold that load, but let me scale up infrastructure in response to that. And as soon as the first pod comes online, you can see it responds there in 17 seconds. So all those transactions got responded to within 17 seconds. That's long. 
It's long because of the cold start latency you see in a serverless architecture. We don't want to pay for all that infrastructure being running if we're not using it, and we weren't using it until I hit that button. You can kind of see on the next transaction, we do all of that in two seconds. So I can keep hitting it here, and you'll notice that it'll actually start to downscale automatically as well, because I'm not really hitting it that hard. As a matter of fact, let's just run a little polar to kind of just, you know, you know, tap up against it, so a single user sending in one little transaction, like three transactions per second, and you'll notice it'll downscale. But it took, what, that 17 seconds. Let's do the same for Node.js. Uh, same for Node.js. Uh, KN burst, let's see. And, you, and you'll get different numbers, but you know, I never know what numbers I'm going to get until I run it, because the infrastructure is a big old cluster running different things. And let's see what it does. Here's bringing up Node.js. Again, the same concept, 40 different users pounding up against the endpoint. We wait for the one to come running. And notice it has to be three by three. That's because there's two sidecars in a Knative architecture. And there we go. And let's see, and that one took 21 seconds, so it took a little longer for Node to come up, but sometimes they're a little closer in number. And then I can basically tap on it as well, so we'll keep, keep one of those things alive. And you'll notice on my Quarkus one now, it's starting to terminate three of them, because a single user just running a, a, a three transactions per second doesn't need uh, four different application servers running. One application server can handle that. Same thing with Node.js. You'll see it also, it'll downscale uh, once, it, once it realizes that the surge is over. The burst is over, it'll downscale it. So that concept of a serverless architecture means you only pay for what you use. You only pay for the memory when you need the memory. You only pay for the CPU when you need the CPU. Otherwise, reduce that footprint and let other people use that infrastructure is kind of the point. So I want to show you what this looks like, though, in the context of, da, 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 let's come over here. And this is my namespace. I call this one side by side. And so this is Prometheus. It's part of the infrastructure for Kubernetes. And oh, by the way, this is, I am running all this on OpenShift. And you can kind of see right there, there's my Node.js's. Some of them are going to be terminating. There's my uh, Quarkus. And then I also, you know, you can see there's deployments. This is standard Kubernetes stuff here. I also have Go, I have Python, I have Spring Boot, things like that. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. Knative is ensuring that it dynamically autoscales. You can kind of see there's the Knative labels on those, on those deployments. So standard Kubernetes behavior, except for the fact that with Knative, it does this crazy autoscaling thing. So the side-by-side -side project. Uh, Prometheus, and the container is called user container. Let's hit execute here. Okay, and so this top line here is our Node.js. You yep, can't see it there, but it's kind of hard to see. You can see it says that's the Node.js fellow right there running. Okay, and let's see, what, what do we got here? And this is our Quarkus. Okay, so in this case, the difference is, you know, what, about 20 meg versus about 28 meg or something like that. So these, the numbers here are a little bit closer. Again, your mileage will vary depending on how much you run here. But you can see that basically Java, Java is pretty consistently smaller than Node.js on this memory footprint. So that matters in a world where you're going to pay by the hour for the memory and the CPU. That's the easiest way for you to think of it. OK, so hopefully you guys got a, a feel for what you can do with the, you know, we showed you all the application programming logic, kind of showed you how we interact with this thing. And you can kind of get a feel for what it looks like in a real Kubernetes cluster. You can see now it's down to the one Node.js and one Quarkus running. I could load up the Go. I could load up the Python, things like that. We could show it to you. But we're out of time. So let me kind of bring this to a close here. Uh, the way we do compile to native is with Growl VM and the native image capability and substrate. And that allows us to do these clever things in a Kubernetes-style architecture. Uh, we won't have to spend a lot of time on that. We kind of showed you what this does, but the concept is very straightforward. You basically declare how many replicas you want. You saw me do that, actually. We showed you that. And then basically it goes out here and scales it out across the cluster. Okay, all these different worker nodes. You can even see my worker nodes right here. Uh, compute, and you can see my machine sets. I basically have, oh, and I gotta be in the right project. And you can see I have six different worker nodes in this cluster that I have set up here. Okay, and that's what we're running up against. And so that allows me to scale out. As a matter of fact, uh, if I come over here and say kubectl get pods, o wide, you'll even see the node it got assigned to. Okay, you can see in this case they're both uh, on you know two different nodes there, two different servers. Okay, and so let's wrap this up. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just leave you here. Okay. It's just the beginning, it's not the end. But do note at the bottom here, you will see, there we go, you will see the, 
if I have to I have stop moving the cursor, but you will see that there's the bit.ly Quarkus Java. That's the slide deck URL. All this content is available to you in open source. Quarkus IO is certainly available to you in open source. Everything we do at Red Hat is open source. I am now officially out of time, but I will happily stay afterwards and answer questions for you. What do you guys think? Well, thank you so much for your attention, and thank you so much for your participation. And again, I will be available for questions afterwards. Thank you so much.